What's up, heathens? How you doing? Today, we're going to be taking another look at Christian TikTok. And we've got this guy who's going to be proposing this. Hey, did you know that you could scientifically prove the existence of God? Well, I'm going to scientifically prove the existence of God using Thomas Aquinas' five ways. Oh, awesome. So this is only a minute long because it's TikTok. Are you going to use all five of Aquinas' ways? I've recently been told that apparently I haven't actually interacted with Aquinas' five ways. And so therefore I haven't taken on serious apologetics. So let's see what this guy has for us today as far as the Aquinas' five ways to prove God. My guess is, is that nothing is going to be scientific as he has proposed initially here. So if you're interested in debunking at least one of Aquinas' five ways, then please stay tuned. All right, heathen, so our guide today is going to be describing the prime mover argument, or the argument from first cause. So I'll let him go ahead and kind of explain what this whole argument is. Thomas Aquinas sat there one day and he said, the world is full of physical things, right? This is a physical thing. He's a physical thing. And he said that physical things, they move, right? This is moving, this is moving. But he noticed that nothing can move itself. Everything that moves needs a mover. This cross is moving as I move it. Thomas Aquinas is moving as I move him. Everything needs a mover. And he noticed that if everything physical needs a mover, then how did things begin to move in the first place? Because the first thing couldn't have moved itself so he concluded that the first thing that moved everything could not have been a physical thing it must have had a higher nature and therefore itself had to remain unmoved therefore nothing moves it and so if nothing moves it nothing could have moved it into existence and likewise nothing could have moved it out of existence therefore if nothing can move it out of existence it must still exist today therefore this thing we call god yeah so i don't know if you noticed immediately right off the bat he goes into this long spiel that does not include any kind of science whatsoever. At best, you could say that it's philosophical in nature, but it's definitely not science. So what does the science actually say? Well, luckily, modern physics has thoroughly debunked this prime mover idea. Newton's first law of motion states that any particle that is at rest or is moving will continue to stay in those states unless an external force is applied to it. So basically what this means for the prime mover argument is that it's just as natural for a particle to be moving in a constant velocity as it is for it to be at rest. Inherently, in the prime mover argument, everything is at rest and then begins to move because of the prime mover. This is not what we actually experience in reality. Because particles are naturally at rest or moving at constant velocities, we have no need for a prime mover. But that's not the only thing that thoroughly debunks the prime mover argument. The Michelson-Morley experiment that failed to detect the aether, which, if you don't know, the aether is a medium that light supposedly traveled through before we understood what light was. That experiment also established that there is no standard or absolute frame of reference for the universe. Then Albert Einstein used this conclusion from the Michelson-Morley experiment to inform his special theory of relativity. The Michelson-Morley experiment combined with Einstein's special relativity showed that there's no absolute motion in the universe. Basically, nothing has an absolute reference. It's all relative to where it is and how fast it's moving. This makes the idea of a prime mover completely absurd. But also, in case you didn't notice in this guy's little clip here, he specially pleaded for his particular god. He says that his god is special and is outside of the need for a mover or a cause. He just ad hoc asserts that his god doesn't need to be created. Nothing that this guy has proposed has been scientific whatsoever. And the prime mover argument of Aquinas' five ways, which is the first way of Aquinas, is utter nonsense and is not scientific. Our modern understanding of physics definitely shows that we don't need a prime mover to explain why things are here now in this universe. Hey, heathens! Uh, so as you can tell, um, that previous section that I shot 
was actually shot at my home studio, which is not really a proper studio, but, you know, it's at home. Now I'm not at home, and we're actually in Gatlinburg, and we're having a little bit of a work trip. So I wanted to add on to the previous portion about Aquinas' five ways, because the guy in the video only covered one of his ways, and that's the prime mover. And so now we're going to go over the other ways that Aquinas presents for his uh, existence of God arguments. The second way is the first cause. And this way is completely fallacious. It argues that everything in this universe has a cause, therefore there, have to be, there has to be some kind of first cause to start everything off. This is illogical because, for one, there's nothing that says that an infinite regress can happen, because that's one of the things that's inherent to the argument, is this idea that you can only go back so far. But there's nothing to suggest that an infinite regress can't happen. Because in mathematics, infinite regresses are a thing that actually exists. So theoretically, we can infinitely regress into the past and never reach a first cause. But the question that I have to ask is, if there are no infinite regresses at all, then what is the largest number that we could possibly have? What is the lowest number that we could possibly have on the negative end? I really don't think that you can come up with a good answer for that because there is no top or bottom to the scale of numbers. But this argument, just like the previous one, makes a special pleading argument for God. Basically, everything in this universe has a cause, but then you place God outside of this universe so that he doesn't have to have a cause. This is a special pleading argument for that exact reason. The third way of Aquinas is called the necessary being. From what I can gather from reading Aquinas' argument, this is just an ad hoc argument that stipulates that God is necessary for the universe in reality in general to be here. But there's no reason for this, and I would say that you cannot distinguish God from the very fabric of reality. Why can't the very fabric of reality just simply exist eternally like you claim that God does? I don't think that you have a good argument against that. Now, before I get on into the last two of Aquinas' ways, the first three are commonly known as the cosmological argument. You will hear these arguments being repeated by apologists like Frank Turek or William Lane Craig or Cameron Bertuzzi from Capturing Christianity. They all use these basic arguments in order to support their claim that God exists. That's why I'm fairly certain that Aquinas is pretty much the father of all apologetics for the existence of God. All of his five ways are regularly used in different ways in order to support the existence of God. Many people have reworked these ways in order to try to make them look new, but they're really not changed since Aquinas' day. Now, to get on with the list, the fourth way is God as the absolute being. You might recognize this from Frank Turk's moral argument. Basically, that God is the absolute foundation for things in reality, and therefore, he is the thing that we judge things against, like morality. When, in fact, most if not all of those things that you would judge against God as being the foundation are really subjective and depend on you as the person as well as where you're at, what time you're in, and what culture and society that you're in. I would say that this is one of the weaker ways of Aquinas because this argument, like many aspects of the previous arguments, is just an ad hoc assertion that God is this thing. It's also painfully obvious to see that we don't actually judge by this absolute foundation, rather we judge by a subjective foundation. Finally, the fifth way is God as the grand designer. And this is the whole, well, if it looks designed, then it must be designed. Or what we would typically call the teleological argument. This is the argument from design. Basically, it just ad hoc supposes that God is the designer of things without any consideration for nature being the explanation for why things are the way they are. Everything that we've experienced so far has been explained by natural processes and natural causes. So to suppose that some kind of supernatural deity is needed to suspend the natural order of events to cause natural things to happen 
is just illogical and ridiculous. So these were Aquinas's five ways. There's, like I said before, there's been some talk about how I haven't considered uh, Aquinas's five ways, but Aquinas's five ways are pretty much just all apologetics now. They're just wrapped into different packages to make them seem different when they really aren't. Thank you, heathens, for joining us today in the Smoky Mountains, which you can't really see them back there, but they are definitely smoky right now. If you will, please go down below and let me know what you think about Aquinas' five ways. I'd love to hear what you think. While you're down there, make sure you smash that like button and subscribe if you want to see more of Smokey here. Don't forget to stand up and use your voice. Bye, heathens!